It's Tuesday. Tuesday means it's comedy, variety, and drama. Not horror. Horror is Thursday. I'll keep drilling this into everybody's heads until we all get it. So it's Tuesday, and I picked uh, for this particular show comedy, and I picked a show that got a lot of reaction when we played an episode of it a few weeks ago. Lots of personal emails to me from people saying, wow, that was a surprise. They really, really liked it. And so I thought, okay, I'll pull out uh, another recording of the same show. Well, different show, but same show. It, it's the uh, official dad joke show. It pays to be ignorant. A satire of quiz shows uh, with a bunch of vaudevillians doing dad joke after dad joke after dad joke. So if you like dad jokes, keep listening. If dad jokes rub you the wrong way, you might want to wait till Thursday and listen to a horror show. But we're going to do the It Pays to Be Ignorant show from August 10th, 1945. Um, this is a raw transfer from the original transcription discs. I have done no restoration to it whatsoever. There are a couple skips here and there in the beginning because the glass transcription discs were cracked and the person that transferred it for me didn't uh, was not able to make the corrections on the skips we can do it later but hey you're going to get a raw file so enjoy it now here's it pays to be ignorant from august 10th 1945 the good old days of radio show continues this program will be interrupted for any important news bulletin <laughs> is parsley. Something you brush aside to see what's behind it. Correct. Pay that man eight dollars. What do they call a soldier that rides on a train? Passengers. Correct. Pay that man nine dollars because... It pays to be ignorant. Presented by Philip Morris Cigarettes and Johnny. <laughs> Johnny, Johnny in his red coat and brass button, stepping out of store windows and counters all over the country to bring you that quiz program known as the Moron's Delight, It Pays to be Ignorant. Well, Friday, August the 10th brings you once more that quiz program that is unrehearsed, uninhibited, and unimportant. We have a board of experts who are so dumb they think a peeping Tom is a wolf out window shopping. First, <laughs> first we have the celebrated author, Mr. Harry McNaughton, who has just written a book entitled Ten Nights in the Subway or The Charge of the Fight Brigade. But here he is, Mr. Harry McNaughton. Thank you. I have a poem, Mr. Howard. Oh, yeah. Yes. There was a young lady from Ghent whose nose was terribly bent. One day she arose and followed her nose. Now no one knows which way she went. I, I, <laughs> terrible. How do you manage to think up such things? Oh, they come to me when I'm asleep at night, you see. So uh -huh. I get right up and write them down. I see. Yes, I go from bed to verse. You go from bed... Ah, oh, please. <laughs> you go from bed to verse. I know, yes. You had to spring that one. All right, <laughs> next we have a woman. Next we have a woman who travels with the upper set. She can't afford a lower set. A woman... A woman who goes around with the 400, but she doesn't look a pound over 350... Here she is, Miss Lulu McConnell. You know, Mr. Howard, the bank I do business with sent back one of my checks last week, and it was marked no funds. Yeah, well, what about it? Can you imagine a big bank like that not having any funds? I can Ah, oh, please, <laughs> cut it out, will ya? Next, we have a man who, when he was six years old, was so mean, his parents ran away from home. <laughs> A man, a man who spent four years in kindergarten then took a postgraduate course in hooky. He only went to school once a year. That was to find out when the summer vacation started. 
Here he is, Mr. George Shelton. Oh, is that so? Well, I went to school quite often. Uh huh. I'll never forget my school days. I imagine. I was in love with my school teacher. Uh -huh. Of course, nothing ever came of it on no. account of the difference in our ages. Oh, I see. Yeah. I was ten years older than she was. I see. <laughs> Well, you, uh, you have just met the experts, folks, so don't voice your opinions out loud. Here's the first question. Let's see what we can do with it this evening. Yes. Pay attention. Here's the question. How many posts are there on a four-post bed? You know, Mr. McNaughton? Would I know what? Uh, how many posts there are on a four-post bed? I'm afraid I wouldn't know. You see, I never read the post in bed. You never read it. <laughs> I always read the New York Times. Uh-huh. Well, I see we're off on the wrong foot already. Do you know Miss McConnell? No, I do not. I never get a chance to read the newspapers at all. All right. My housework keeps we... me so busy. Yeah. First, there's my old man's breakfast to get. Then yeah, I but... got to pack his lunch. All right. Then there's the dishes to yeah. wash. Then I got to start off look, my house. Look, By the please. time I get that done, it's yeah. dinner time. Then look. the dishes are in Miss the Miss McConnell, then I have please. To sit down the bed. Will you sit I'm... down a minute and take a cup of tea? Take an hour off for lunch, will you? That, look, the question is not about newspapers. Well, what is the question about? It's about bed. Oh, bed. bed. I went down yesterday to buy a bedroom suit. Imagine the guy asked me two, $200 for a bedroom suit. Did you buy it? What do I want to pay $200 for a bedroom suit for? I'll still keep to my nightgown. Right. <laughs> right. I, I never have any visitors anyway. Uh, all never right, anything. please. The question is, how many posts are there on a four-poster bed? Well, Mr. Howard, tell me, how big is the bed? Ah, oh, please. What difference does that make? Well, it makes a lot of difference, I mean. Suppose it's a single bed, you see, and four people want to sleep in it. I see. Well, four people couldn't sleep in a single bed. No, but they could play pinochle. Oh, <laughs> cut it out. Cut it out, please. You know, my Uncle Webb put up on the farm has the biggest bed I think I ever saw. Yeah. It's 10 feet wide and 15 feet long. I think that's a lot of bunk. A lot of bunk. <laughs> oh, Mr. McNaught. Oh, I'm very naughty tonight. You, you know, know a funny thing about my Uncle Webfoot, you know, he whistles in his sleep. You mean he talks in his sleep? No, he whistles. The other morning when he woke up, there were four taxi cabs in the room. Ah, oh, well, you <laughs> cut it out. Hey. Miss McConnell, tell me, does your husband talk in his sleep? No. No, he just smiles. That's what makes me mad. Yeah. If he'd only say something. Yeah, then you'd know where you're <laughs> Say, you know, you know, uh, I, uh, I slept in a Murphy bed last night. Yeah, how was it? I didn't like it. Murphy snored all night. <laughs> Look, please, I'm trying to get an answer to the question. How many posts are there in a four-poster bed? The question's not about sleep. My old man bought me a feather bed last week. Yeah, how'd you like it? I was tickled silly. Yeah. <laughs> you were silly before you were tickled. <laughs> now, let's get on here. You know, over at our boarding house, I sleep with a fella. He walks in his sleep. He walks in his sleep? Yeah, you know, I think he's an Indian. Well, what makes you think he's an Indian? Every time he walks, he takes the blankets with him. Ain't that terrible? <laughs> must be, yes. That old man of mine sure is a sound sleeper. He's a sound sleeper? Is he? Why, well, some of the sounds he makes, you can hear all over Long Island. Uh, oh, <laughs> Long Island sound. Lo oh, <laughs> cut it out, Johnny. Let's oh, I did just sit out and step in here, will you please? Sure, Mr. Howard. I'll just find the experts a carton of Philip Morris cigarettes, which I'll give to the Coast Guardsman in the front row. That'll be real nice. <laughs> Thank you. Now, here's the next question. And stop fooling around. Yes. In what room in the house, in what room of the house do we find the kitchen sink? <laughs> Mr. Howard, I, I didn't quite get that, old boy. Would you mind repeating it? Well, I'll repeat it. It's very simple. In what room in the house do you find the kitchen sink? The question should be right in your backyard, Miss McConnell. There is no kitchen sink in my backyard. All right, all right. Let's get on here. In what room in the house do we find the kitchen sink? Would you know, Mr. McRodden? Well, how many rooms are there in the house, Mr. Howard? Oh, look, that is neither here nor there. Then where is it? Where... <laughs> where is what? The house. If it's neither here nor there, then it don't exist. If it don't exist, the, the, there wouldn't be any rooms. Look. No rooms, no kitchen. No kitchen, no kitchen sink. Yeah. That's very simple. Yeah, I see. Don't take any brains to figure that out. Uh-huh. You're marvelous, Mr. Sheldon. That's what I keep telling myself. Yeah. Where'd you get your education? I went to school, stupid. Uh-huh. And you came out stupid. <laughs> Surely, Miss McConnell, you know uh, what room your kitchen sink is in. So 
certainly. My kitchen sink is in the bedroom. Your, your kitchen sink is in the bedroom? Yes, I have a one-room apartment. You have a one-room apartment. You know, you know, I used to have a beautiful apartment. In... <laughs> Don't mind her, Mr. McCon. I beg your pardon? Don't mind her. She's at that age where she eats her potatoes and soup, if you oh, know what does, I mean. Yeah. yeah. Well, as I was about to say, I used to have a beautiful apartment in Chicago overlooking the stockyard. Yeah. On a clear day, you could see meat. On a clear day, you could yeah. see meat. <laughs> but I have, a nice, I have a nice apartment now in New York overlooking green fields. Uh -huh. In New York overlooking green fields? Yes, green fields, delicatessen store. Uh -huh. <laughs> Mr. McNaught, why don't you take a walk on top of a picket fence some night in your bare feet? I tried to. <laughs> it tickles. It tickles, I can say. We, we have a beautiful apartment. Small, but nice. All we have to do when we want water is get three knocks on the steam pipe. Uh, to get hot water? Yep. Yeah, well, I see. Well, that's very nice. Yeah, and then the janitor gives three knocks back. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? That means we ain't gonna get it. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know, I have a nice apartment over at my boarding house. I have hot and cold running. Uh, hot and cold running what? I don't know, but they're running. Uh, <laughs> nice. I, I'd like to get another apartment, but my old man don't want to move. Mm -hmm. You know, he hasn't left our house in 20 years. Hasn't left the house in 20 years? Why? He can't find his pants. I see. <laughs> you, know, I... you know, I lived on Fifth Avenue for 10 years. Well, that... Uh... Wait a minute. You lived on Fifth Avenue for ten years? All right, then. I lived on Tenth Avenue for five years. <laughs> <laughs> you know, after all, you know, I like living in the country. Yes, I'm always glad to get back to my little house nestled in the trees. <laughs> How it got up in the trees, I'll never know. Ah, oh, Johnny, step in and get those three chipmunks down out of the trees, will you? Yes, sir, Mr. Howard. The fine will be the carton of Philip Morris cigarettes, which I'll give to the soldier in the front row. Go. <laughs> And now before our experts find the kitchen sink and let the program go down the drain, here's something that I think you'd like to know. Just recently, Philip Morris bought the only important available supply of ripened and matured tobacco in the United States. Somewhere around 17 million pounds of superb, fragrant tobacco, fully ripened, aged, and mellowed, ready for the masterful blending and the famed Philip Morris method of manufacture which makes every Philip Morris such a superior cigarette, so much finer in flavor, so much less irritating to nose and throat. Yes, you Philip Morris smokers are more fortunate than others who have to put up with bite and harshness, which usually result from the use of new and unripened tobaccos. No longer do you have to put up with substitutes or unknown brands, because this great tobacco purchase assures still more generous supplies of Philip Morris in the very near future for all of you who smoke Philip Morris. You here at home, as well as our boys and girls in the armed forces. All these facts still further ensure Philip Morris' unvarying superiority in flavor and enjoyment. And always remember, Philip Morris' superiority is recognized by eminent medical authorities. No other cigarette can make that statement. Thank you, Ken Roberts. Now we come to our contestants. While Mr. Roberts is getting the folks up here, we turn with no expectations to our auguster. An auguster that gets paid for making noise that other people would get arrested for. Here he is, Dr. Novick and his melody killers. Dr. Novick. There's only one of them tonight. <laughs>
bed to verse. Spring is here. see the savage beast that that music would charm. That's terrible. Well, who is our first contestant, Mr. Roberts? Our first contestant tonight, Mr. Howard, is Sergeant Thomas O'Brien of the United States Army. Well, that's fine. Fine looking soldier he is there, Ken. How do you do, Sergeant O'Brien? And thank you a lot for coming up. How do you feel, sir? Pretty good, sir. Well, you certainly do look it. Young man, you have quite a lot of decorations there, haven't you? Is that, is that the purple heart I see? That's right. It is? Congratulations. That's marvelous. It certainly is. Boy, you've got to have a broad chest to wear all those decorations you have. Where, where is your hometown, would you care to uh, tell us? Utica, New York. Utica, New York. Good for Utica. Utica, New York. Well, wake me up and call me B.O. Plenty. All right. <laughs> Are you, are you still working that town? <laughs> yeah, I was a dentist in a comb factory. You, you were a dentist in a comb factory? I used to put the teeth in combs. <laughs> hey, hey, no, Sergeant, so just let that uh, brush <laughs> off, if you don't mind. What are you doing in here in New York? Um, vacation, furlough. Oh, on a furlough. Are you enjoying yourself? Oh, immensely. Well, that's fine. I certainly do hope you're having a good time. How long have you been in the service? Uh, four years and three months. Four years and three months. Good. I bet you've seen something in those four years. I say, you know, you know, Sergeant O'Brien, I, I worked in the shipyard during the last war. Mm-hmm. Worked in the shipyard. I was a porthole tester. Uh, wait a minute. Uh, a port, a porthole tester? Yes, you see, I'd shove my head through a porthole, and if I couldn't get it out again, the porthole was too small. Right. <laughs> Then, then, then they'd make another one. Uh -huh. What, a head? No, not another head. No, he, he, he could use one, no doubt. Uh, well, we're very, very happy to have you with us, Sergeant. Yeah, we sure okay. are. What's your first name, honey? Thomas. Thomas? That's right. Oh, I love that name, Thomas. Isn't that a pretty name, Thomas? Thomas. I love the name of Thomas. Yeah. On some people. On some people. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, Thomas, you're just as cute. You're just a water. Look here, Thomas. Look, you are. Oh, you're just too yeah, cute. Yeah. Well, lose your head in a minute if you don't yeah. stop shaking it. <laughs> you, you can just call me cuticle. Yeah. Cuticle. I, I grow on you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so does a wart. Look, <laughs> Sergeant, will you do us a favor while you're here? Will you reach into the dunce cap there and pick out a question for us, please? And when you get one, would you be kind enough to read it right into the microphone, if you will? Uh, how, how do you spell Mississippi? Very good. How do you spell Mississippi? Looks like we got a spelling bee on our hands. Yes. Well, what, what was the question, Mr. Hard? How do you spell Mississippi? Uh, river or state? <laughs> All right. River. R-I-V-E-R. -E river. <laughs> Mr. McNaughton, is stupidity your only talent? No, 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 but it's the only one I specialize in. Uh -huh. <laughs> Mr. Sheldon, do you know anything about spelling? What are you talking about? Listen to that guy. What a question. Do I know anything about spelling? Why, me and my brother were the best spellers at PS 68. If, it were any, if there was a word, any word that could be spelled, and if I couldn't spell it, my brother could. Okay, spell Mississippi. Emma, Emma. That's one of the words my brother could spell. <laughs> I don't think any of you ever went to school. Oh, no, just a minute, old boy. I challenge that remark. 
Well, do I remember my school days. My teacher used to take me on her knee. What did your teacher look like? I couldn't tell. You see, when I was on her knee, I was always face down. You were face down. <laughs> Please, will you just try and spell Mississippi? What is you, was your favorite subject in school, Miss McConnell? English. E English? Why, well, you don't even speak it. <laughs> Hold on. Well, all right, let me see how good you are in English. Take this sentence. Mary milked the cow. What mood? What? I said Mary milked the cow. What mood? The cow. No, no. Wait. <laughs> That's not what I mean. What does the cow what does the cow stand for? Mary. Please. The cow don't stand for Mary. Then how's she gonna milk it? Then I... <laughs> That's right, Miss McConnell, you got him there. Besides, what's that got to do with spelling? This is a spelling question. Look, I know that. Spell Mississippi. Then. There you go again. Mississippi, Mississippi. You'd think it was the only word in the English language. Mississippi. All right, I'll give you an easy one. Spell bum. B-M, bum. <laughs> That's wrong. I know, I left you out. I have to... <laughs> Howard, this, uh, this Mississippi, isn't that the river George Washington crossed? Oh, you're thinking about, you're thinking about the Delaware. Sure, but he didn't cross it. He just threw a dollar across. No, you're wrong. No, I'm sure he crossed it. I remember seeing the picture. There he was standing in the front of the boat. He was standing? Hmm. You mean traveling conditions was just as crowded in those days? Oh, no, no. Oh, my word, Miss McConnell, haven't you ever seen that picture? No, the last picture I saw was a picture of Dorian Gray. Mm. It was all about this young man. He met this young girl, yes. and she was singing, Goodbye, oh, little wait a yellow bird. Wait a minute, what please. Johnny, oh, please, Bill. before she starts that yellow bird, step in here and give our good friend the sergeant $25 for his question. Certainly, Mr. Hart. I will also give him a carton of Philip Morris cigarettes. Fine. And now as our experts seem to have been stung by this spelling bee, here are a few words of good news for smokers. Yes, it is a fact. More and more Philip Morris cigarettes are right now going to your dealer. And the remarkable tobacco purchase I told you about assures even more generous supplies in the very near future. Of course, your loved ones, our fighting sons and daughters, are still getting their Philip Morris cigarettes. But happily, we are now able also to provide more and more for your dealer and you. So no longer do you need to put up with substitutes or unknown brands. So call for Philip Morris every time. The cigarette of finer flavor, greater enjoyment, and superior protection for the nose and throat. Philip Morris, made by Americans for Americans to suit American taste. Philip Morris, America's finest, popular price cigarette. Thank you, Ken. And now, please, who is our next contestant? Please. Our next contestant, Mr. Howard, is a very lovely and charming little lady, Lance Corporal Mary Doyle of the Canadian Women's Army Corps. Oh, the Canadian Army. Fine. Good evening. Uh, good evening, Miss Doyle, and welcome to It Pays to Be Again. We're very glad to have you with us. How do you feel this evening? Fine, thank you. Well, that is marvelous. You're from Canada, I believe? That's right. And you're away. My, how tall are you? <coughs> huh? Four foot eleven and a quarter. Four foot eleven and a quarter. <laughs> My. What's the quarter for? I don't want the quarter. <laughs> well, we certainly are glad to see you. They sure do turn them out little in Canada. You look real cute. What is that tea you have on your... Would you mind telling me with the... Is that wheat? A she sheaf of wheat there? Or is that corn? If it's corn, it belongs on the show. Is that... <laughs> What's that mean? Well, that means I'm an accountant, and uh, I get 50 cents a day more for my... Oh, job. that means you get 50 cents? <laughs> well, I bet you're worth it. And those other two things, what are they, those red... Two years. Two, two years. years? They must have took you out of the cradle. Uh, two <laughs> years. Well, <laughs> we certainly are glad to have you with us. Say, you? you know, Mr. Howard, this young lady looks just like my uncle. Well, we're glad... <laughs> Wait a minute. You mean like your aunt. She's better off looking like my uncle. <laughs> Pay no attention to Miss Doyle. They just talk to let you know they're breathing, if you know what I mean. What'd you do before you entered the service? Well, I went to school. Oh, I suppose I shouldn't have asked. I might have known <laughs> that. You went to school. Yes. Very attractive girl, isn't she, Mr. Hart? Yes, yeah, she is. Lovely eyelashes. Uh -huh. <laughs> 
Yes, you know, I, I, I have an eye for beauty, you know. Uh-huh. The other one I used to read with. I see. <laughs> Will you do us a favor? Uh, will you do us a favor? I'd like to spend more time with you, but we're getting a little short here. Would you reach in the dunce cap there, Miss Doyle, and pick out a question for us? And would you kindly read it when you get a hold of one? Just take your time, relax, and read it into the microphone, if you will, please. From what animal do you get goat's milk? Uh, very good. <laughs> Did you hear the question? From what animal do we get goat's milk? Mr. Howard, I'm not going to ask you to repeat the question. Good. Because I'm not going to answer it. I see. <laughs> Therefore, it won't be necessary for you to repeat it. <laughs> Mr. McDonald, why don't you take a long walk on a short pier? <laughs> I don't mind a long walk. But I hate a short beer. I didn't say that. <laughs> the question is, do you know what animal? Do you know what animal we get goat's milk from, Miss McConnell? No, I never drink it. Cow's milk is good enough for me. All right, but we're not talking about cows. Why, what's the matter with cows? A cow is a man's best friend. Oh, I think you're wrong, old boy. A dog is a man's best friend. Yeah, but you can't get milk from a dog. <laughs> no, but a puppy can. A puppy can. <laughs> Look, we're not talking about dog. Oh, now he's not talking about dog. You don't want to talk about anything. Nothing but Mississippi, hey, look, Mississippi. I'm done with that. Ah, what did you do? Get up on the wrong side of the floor this morning? Never mind. I want an answer to the question. I got another smart dog. Oh, is he smart? When I say to him, are you coming or aren't you? He either comes or he don't. I see. <laughs> I you know, I got a dog that knows as much as I do. You got a dog that knows as much as you yeah. do? That's why they call them dumb animals. I, I didn't know. Now, just a minute. I got that. I got that. That was a dirty dig, Mr. Howard. A dirty dig, and I'll just give you one minute to take it back. Uh-huh. Suppose I refuse to take it back. Well, you can always get an extension of time. I oh. thought so, yeah. I think, I think, you know, the other day I, I saw a dog picking a man's pocket. A dog picking a man's pocket? Yes, he was a Pekingese. He was picking... <laughs> he was picking his pocket. He was picking his pocket. That's terrible. Now what? Another fit. I don't get it. All right, <laughs> When I was in Hollywood, I got the cutest little terrier. When you were in Hollywood, you got what? A cute little terrier. Uh -huh. Oh, was he a fox terrier? No, he worked for Paramount. Ah, uh -huh, I'm saying. <laughs> Miss, Miss McConnell, is your head on upside down? I don't know. I left home so early this morning, I never looked in the mirror. I see. You want to do that sometime. I will. I think you've got a head off a cane or something tonight. Will you please get back to the question, what animal do we get goat's milk from? You know, my Uncle Webb put up on his farm raises goats. Oh, really? That's nice. How, how do you raise a goat, Mr. Shelton? Oh, it's very easy. You get down on your knees, crawl under his stomach, and then raise up. Ain't that <laughs> Johnny, that's all I can stand. And stop in here and give our charming guest from Canada $25 for a question. Yes, Mr. Hahn, I will also give her a carton of Philip Morris cigarettes. There are two ways you can help keep meat prices down and have a better chance at your fair share. Beat the black market in meat. Pay ration points in full and never pay more than ceiling price. This is your best insurance against a still worse meat shortage. Thank you. Uh, well, folks, we'd like to stay with you a little longer, but our timekeeper, Mr. Palazzi, tells us our time is up. But we'll be back again your way this time next week again, same station, if that's anything to look forward to. So here, here is that hog caller from Monmouth County to tell you what we mean when we say... It pays to be ignorant, to be dumb, to be dense, to be ignorant. It pays to be ignorant just like me. I took my girl to dinner. We had a wonderful feast. They had to give my girl the check because I couldn't read. So you see, it pays to be ignorant. Have no brain, be your name, just be ignorant. It pays to be ignorant just like me. Join us again next week at the same time when Johnny presents It Pays to be Ignorant. Listen also on Sunday nights to the Philip Morris Crime Doctor, brought to you over most of these same stations. All prize money distributed by this program is duplicated by Philip Morris in gifts to the Army and Navy Relief Society. It's happening all over America. Thousands who never smoked pipes before are turning to revelation. It's the pipe tobacco you can inhale. Yes, you can inhale it. 
Try Revelation in a pipe. So mild, cool, and gentle. Ask for Revelation. Only 15 cents. This is Johnny again, returning now to the thousands of store windows and counters all over America. Look for me. I'll be waiting for you. Come in and... Goodbye, Johnny. We'll be hearing you over these same stations next Friday at this same time. This is Ken Roberts. This is Tom Howard saying good night and good nonsense. <laughs> this is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. And that was It Pays to be Ignorant from August 10th, 1945, sponsored by Philip Morris Cigarettes. The good old days of radio show and me in particular do not endorse smoking, but we're leaving the commercials in so you can get an idea about how they marketed tobacco to the American public back in the 1940s. Uh, interesting, the little comment about uh, it's, uh, it's good for you to smoke these things and... <laughs> You don't have to worry because it's less irritating than everything else you could smoke. So anyway, uh, they, they really uh, figured out how to market those things. This show, I guess, was heard here today for the very first time since it was originally broadcast. About five or six years ago, I received a pile of glass 16-inch transcription discs of It Pays to Be Ignorant, which were found in a closet in an abandoned house in Brooklyn. Apparently, whoever lived in that house at one point had something to do with the show. We don't know what. We don't know if it was a producer or, or somebody. But anyway, there were a whole run of It Pays to Be Ignorant shows, all of which had cracks in them. And so they do have little issues here and there. That one had a couple skips at the beginning. Uh, eventually, they'll all be restored and released somewhere, I guess. But in the meantime, you get to enjoy it. So, uh, And that's kind of how some of these things come up, too. People think these radio shows just magically appear out of nowhere. They don't. Uh, they come from original 16-inch records, sometimes made out of aluminum, sometimes made out of glass, and the glass ones are particularly prone to breakage or crackage, and when they crack or break, they're very difficult to deal with. So we save as many of them as we can. We rescue them all over the country uh, in any form we can find them, and you will get more of these as we continue on with this series. Some shows will be things that are out there and circulating around amongst collectors, and other shows will be like this one, heard for the very first time since originally broadcast. So you got a little bit of an exclusive here today. All right, until next Tuesday or Thursday, if you want the scary stuff, make sure you tell all your friends. Make sure if you have any questions, go to goodolddaysofradio.com or the Good Old Days of Radio Facebook page, and you can ask questions, you can request shows, you can do whatever, and I'll try to accommodate where I can. And we will be back here next Tuesday with more comedy, variety, and drama. And on Thursday with more scary shows as we round out the last few of the top ten horror shows of all time. So, until then, this is John Tefteller saying, see you next time. Thank you.